Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for having me here, and thanks for attending this tutorial. I'm Guang Miao. In this tutorial, I'm going to introduce spectrum and energy efficiency in 5G mobile data networks. Before I start introducing the technologies, I want to show the analogy between lighting and the communications, because the lighting and the communications are very similar to each other. Both are based on electromagnetic waves. And if you look at the development of lighting technologies in the past, they also have something like this first generation, second generation, and third generation. The first generation is these oil lamps. So these were the first kind of lighting technologies that were massively produced and available almost everywhere in the world. So this one basically provides the illumination capabilities. And then later people developed these gas lights. So now these gas lights are deployed everywhere on the street and so on. It provides much better, a much brighter and better looming capacity. And then people develop these electrical lamps, and then we develop all kinds of lamps. Like we, in the outdoors, in the streets, we have this flood light and street lights and so on. And the indoors, we have these ceiling lights, and we have these desktop lamps and all that. So on the other hand, if you compare this to the cellular networks nowadays, in outdoors, we have these macro cells. They are used to illuminate, basically, the the cell phones or like cellular equipment in the broader area, but the indoor, in hot spot <coughs> areas, we have those smaller cells like femtocells, femtocells, pickle cells, and so on to illuminate the smaller areas, right? So, so now we can see a lot of similarities. On the other hand, if we try to compare the development history of these lighting technologies with that of wireless technologies, it may inspire us a little bit about what we may do in the future. That's why I would like to compare these two. So this shows the timeline of the lighting technology in the past. The oil lamp was invented in 1780. And then we have this gas lamp, and starting in the 1800, we have the electric lamp. And then we have the all different kinds of electric lamps, like this arc lamp, this bamboo filament, uh, this electric light lamp, and we have this gas charged lamp and a mercury lamp and neon lighting. So you can see as we develop in, the, in this almost 100 years, people are developing different technologies, trying to make the lights to be brighter and brighter. And on the other hand, if you look at this, starting from 1926, the fluorescent lamp was invented. And this dramatically reduces the energy consumption of of lighting, and then it extends the lifetime to five years. And then in 1962, the LED lamp was invented. It achieved another 40% further energy reduction. And it achieved now 32 years of life. So if you look at all this below, it's all about how different energy efficient lamps should be designed. We have this red LED, this compact fluorescent lamp, starting from 2010. Governments worldwide start to force to phase out these incandescent light bulbs because they are not energy efficient at all. If now, if we have an overlook of the history in the past, basically we have 145 years of capacity improvement. And then we have, starting from 1926, the focus is completely on this energy efficiency enhancements. And it's been ongoing for 87 years. Actually, this is it's more than 87 years now. It's like maybe 90 years, right? So this shows the timeline of the lighting and the wireless technologies. The light starts from 1790, and the wireless technology is starting from 1890. It's 100 behind, exactly. And then the research focus is changed to energy efficient design for lighting technology, starting from 1926, right? And after that, it's all about energy efficient designs. And then for wireless communications, you can see, now the, I would say the world interest is attracted by this energy efficient design starting from around 2010. And if we consider the fact that this like ICT technologies in general will accelerate how fast we do R&D. So there will be some compress of the time. So that means these two overlaps with each other very well. So we can see that the history is repeating itself very well. So maybe now, moving forward, in the following maybe several decades, we can confidently say that we may see many new exciting discoveries about energy efficient designs.
because you can see on top there are so many different exciting discoveries. So what are they going to be? I mean, innovations never stop. So obviously on this timeline, there will be other things. So what would be those things? So it's a wide and open area, so we can try to exploit this great opportunity. So now I will talk about the real energy efficient design and spectrum efficient design technologies. In the following, I will, I'm going to cover three, uh, I would say three or four key aspects. First, I will introduce several fundamental energy efficient transmission technologies, which I call energy capacity approaching design. After that, I will introduce some more system level technologies and also try to introduce some concepts like energy efficient digital ecosystems. All right, so let's start with this energy capacity approaching design. So in the past, our focus has always been attracted by this so-called Shannon's capacity formula. So this Shannon's capacity formula basically is the, tells us the maximum rate at which information can be transmitted consuming a specific spectrum. So this is a capacity formula. So this is capacity formula is amazing because it tells us that, well, for a certain channel, there's a clear upper bound. So if you have not achieved that upper bound, you need to work on it. That's clear. So that's the direction. You need to go there. That's the target. But on the other hand, it also tells us that once you reach that goal, there's nothing else beyond that. You need to move. You need to seek something else. So that's the contribution of this capacity bound. But on the other hand, it's also kind of misleading because our focus has been attracted too much about it. But on the other hand, this will only tell you the achievable data rate given the SNR for a channel. But it does not tell us other things, for example, how you should construct the channel to achieve a better signal quality. And also how you should control this part, the noise plus interference. In practice, we also always need to consider interference. And also how should we allocate bandwidth. So well, now maybe we have already reached the channel's capacity formula using turbo coding. LDPC code, but there's so much more ahead. How should we reshape the wireless design so that it's as I learned for all users in the network is, is the best? So on the other hand, from the energy efficient perspective, we also want to define something called this energy capacity. This basically, we compare these two, and then the energy capacity can be defined as the maximum data rate at which the information can be transmitted consuming a specified power. So you can see spectrum is a resource. So here energy is also a resource. Based on this, we can have this definition. I would say it's the total amount of throughput that can be achieved by the whole network. So this R should be the overall network or system throughput, all users in the system, and then divided by the total power consumption of the whole system. So here this PC is a circuit power. Basically this is power that is independent from transmission or communications. So it's not for, I would say this, Circuit power is not for communication purpose, it's, it is for computation purpose. And on the other hand, this PTR is the power used for transmission or for communications. So, the, so here we can see both power cons consumed in computation and also communication. So in this tutorial, our focus is on how to improve the power consumed in the communications perspective to, to improve the system energy efficiency and also spectrum efficiency. In I mean, other research, you may either, either even consider how to improve this the circuit power as well, that is, the computation power. There are some similarities and distinctions between the spectrum efficiency and energy efficiency. So the capacity, energy capacity of a transceiver link is defined as this. We want to find the modulation, trans coding, and also the power so that the energy efficiency of the link is maximized. So this is a maximization over all possible power modulation coding. There are two equivalent ways to achieve this energy capacity. And one way is, first, we want to fix P. In this case, given P, we want to maximize R over P. So now since this P is, is fixed, then we can simply try to give P and try to maximize the R first, and then divide it over R, and then try to maximize the energy efficiency. In this case, the one in the numerator is the CP. So CP here is basically the spectrum efficiency. So now you can see, in order to achieve this energy capacity, you first need to design a system so that it, it achieves its spectrum efficiency, upper bound. And then on top of that, you need to optimize the power used so that you can maximize or achieve your energy capacity. 
because this is one way of, of achieving this. On the other hand, the other way is we can fix the data rate and then try to find the power to achieve that data rate. So we have this. So in this case, since r is fixed, so maximizing r over p is the same as maximizing r over minimum of p given r. So try to find this. In this case, that means we, in order to achieve this data rate, we only used, need to allocate this amount of power. So this is the inverse of the channel capacity of the spectrum efficiency capacity. So now this is another way of achieving this energy capacity. So this one is basically trying to first you use capacity approaching, the traditional capacity approaching coding, and then you try to allocate power. The other way is you, <coughs> the same. You also use the capacity approaching coding. But on the other hand, you try to adapt the, the rate. These two obviously are the same. So in the following, we will use these two, two methods. I mean, equivalent, yeah. So first, I would like to say this energy capacity approaching link, adap link adaptation. So this theorem tells you basically the optimum way of setting up a transmitter so that it achieves the highest energy efficiency. So this is R optimal is the data rate that you should use if you want to maximize the energy efficiency of out any wireless transmitter. So this one here, this is the circuit power, right? So this PTR is the data rate and the power relationship. So for any wireless transmitter, if you want to use this system to maximize energy efficiency, what you need to do is find the, the, the power consumption and data rate relationship for this one particular transmitter. And then you plug in into this formula and then find the, the data rate, and then this will achieve the highest energy efficiency. OK, so this is the first order derivative of this power rate function. To illustrate how we obtain this, you can take a look at this. Plot. So in this plot, we have the circuit energy consumption for a wireless transmitter. So it is drawn using this blue curve. This is the simple duration. And uh, this is the transmission energy consumption, the blue. The green one is the circuit energy consumption. So this one should be linear. So here we assume the circuit power is fixed. But on the other hand, here we are using the log scale. So that's why here it's of this shape. Indeed, indeed it's linear. And then for, on the other hand, we have this transmission energy consumption. For the transmission energy consumption, we are able to reduce its energy consumption by extending the time we use to transmit a, a symbol. Yeah, this can be achieved simply by using like repetition coding. That means, for example, if you want to minimize the communication energy consumption sending a bit, the way you should do it indeed is you keep on, for example, you can keep on repeating sending the same bit over and over again. On the other hand, you should use the minimum amount of possible power to send it. Then you will be able to minimize the, the total energy, because the energy is always power multiplied by the time t. So the power is decreasing at a faster speed than the increase of the time. So that's why the multiplication, the multiplication of power p over t equals energy it can be reduced. So that's why here you can see the energy is reducing if we extend the simple duration. On the other hand, if we are in, in, increasing the simple duration, then the energy consumption consumed by the computation is increased. So we need to care about the total energy consumption, which is the red curve. So that's why we first see the energy consumption is reduced and then increased. So this formula gives the optimal operating point. This simple, simple duration uniquely determines the data rate, because 1 over the simple duration is the data rate for sending this symbol. So this, this one gives this particular point, which will achieve the minimum energy. So if you inverse this curve, you will see this energy efficiency curve. Because this is energy per bit. You inverse it, you will have bit per joule metric. So the right side shows the energy consumption to transmit one megabit of data. So here you can see we can, with this energy efficient transmission, it always consumes the least amount of energy sending each bit, no matter where the device is at the cell. So this, the x-axis, is the distance to the base station. And then we compare it against several other technologies, like adaptive modulation and coding with 15 dBm transmit power, or 20, 25 dBm transmit power. So this is the, I would say this, this formula is extremely powerful. You can apply it in flat fading channels, in other transmitters, as long as you f find this consumed power given the desired data rate. 
you plug in it, and then you will get the optimal setting. Yeah, so it's it's very powerful. And on the other hand, if you want to take look, take a look at the details, for example, how should we do the transmission in frequency selective channels, right? In this case, the problem will be a bit more complicated. In the previous slide, we have shown that there's a trade-off between the circuit energy consumption and the transmit energy consumption. So this is for flat fading channel or for a one one particular channel, right? On the other hand, if we consider frequency selective channels, there will be different subcarriers or different channels, right? And on each channel, you, they will have different channel gains. In this case, that means there will be different trade-offs on each subcarrier or in, or each subchannel. So in this case, what should we do? We need to find the optimal trade-off trade-off for each subchannel. So what is that, right? So this is what we find, and uh, now we. For the frequency selected channel, we need to sum up all the achievable throughput on each subchannel. And then we want to divide it to all the power consumptions on all subchannels. So now we have this. This one, what can I say? This one, it turns out that after some research, we find that this is strict and quasi concave. But at that time, nobody knows this quasi concavity. So somehow we find it. And then with this strict quasi concave like property, we are able to greatly simplify the proof that there is a unique globally optimal link adaptation for energy sharing transmission in frequency selective channels. This tells you what you should do if you want to achieve the highest energy efficiency, if you want to transmit over frequency selective channels. So this is true. The second one basically tells that if the channel is not good, then you should not transmit anything on that particular channel if you want to improve your energy efficiency. On the other hand, if the channel is good, so so what is the criteria to say if a channel is good or not, right? So this is a criteria. So this criteria basically says that if you transmit any bit on that particular channel, you sh the channel should be good enough so that transmitting anything on that channel will help improve the overall energy efficiency of the system. So that's this criteria, what this criteria says. And then if this criteria is met, then how fast you should transmit, and then the data rate you should transmit on that particular channel is given by this particular formula. So this theorem can be applied, I would say, in all MIMO OFDM systems, whenever you, are, you need to tr deal with energy field transmissions on channels that are all solid to each other. Yeah. So I mean, this looks not so straightforward, right? If we assume the channel's capacity is achieved on on each subchannel. In this case, the understanding can be greatly simplified. So here we have this frequency. We illustrate this using this plot, right? Assume channel capacity is achieved on each subchannel. In this case, the power that we should use on each subchannel is given by this. So it's called dynamic water filling. So now you can see the power you should use on each subchannel is basically determined by the difference between the water level and this inverse of the channel gain. So this, this shadowing area is the amount of power you should use, allocate on each, on this particular subchannel. And on the other hand, the difference between this power allocation and the traditional power allocation is that for the traditional power allocation, this water level is determined by the sum power constraint. But on the other hand, here, this water level is uniquely determined by, by the inverse of the system energy efficiency. Okay, one over U R star, so it's different. By using this simple water feeding, energy efficient power allocation, we can optimally balance the circuit energy consumption and transmit energy consumption on all OFDM subcarriers. Yeah, so this is the optimal approach. If you want to use energy capacity approach in transmissions, and uh, there are some key technology or simple technology that we can use. For example, we can simply increase the channel gain if we want to improve the energy efficiency. So for example, if you are, your phone is about to die, one way for you to minimize your transmission energy is for you to move closer to the base station. That's very easy, right? That's straightforward. And then we can use, reduce the circuit power. So in order to reduce the circuit power, I would say the best way for we to minimize the circuit power is we can use superconducting materials for transmission purposes. In that case, they won't consume any circuit power. But on the other hand, there's almost no 
superconducting material working in the room temperature. You need to use cooling equipment. So those cooling equipment will consume extra power. Those also need to be considered. There's a trade-off there, so it's not so easy. And also you can increase the number of subchannels. This, this part is kind of very interesting because it tells you that if you want to maximize the energy efficiency of a particular user, one very simple way that we can do from a communication perspective is that you can simply assign more subcarriers to that particular user. Then his energy efficiency will be improved. But on the other hand, there are more users. There are many users in the system, maybe more than one, two, three, or 10 users. They all desire higher energy efficiency. So in this case, how should we manage this, the subcarrier allocation? This tells you exactly how you, what you should do regarding the link adaptation. The data rate should increase with channel gain, increase with the circuit power, decrease with the number of subchannels. So on the other hand, there is some trade-off between the energy efficiency and the spectrum efficiency. So the trade-off can be well understood by reading this plot. It almost covers, I would say, all potential situations. This one on the left side, it's the energy efficiency. And uh, the x-axis is the spectrum efficiency. And the right side is the power. The curves without markers, the bottom four curves, are the relationship between the power consumption and the spectrum efficiency. And the top four curves with the markers show the relationship between the energy efficiency and spectral efficiency. So this alpha is basically the average network interference divided by the average signal pass gain. So basically, it, this one shows you how different links are coupled with each other, or how different links are interfering with each other. If alpha is zero, that means the interference pass gain is zero. Basically, in this case, it's just like one individual link sending data. So when alpha is zero, this green curve, this green curve tells you, uh, no, no, I would say let's, let's take a look at this first. This spectral efficiency and power first. This green curve with the marker. So this one tells you the power and the spectral efficiency relationship. So here you can see when alpha is zero, there's no interference. In this case, you can always increase the power and then you will be able to increase your spectral efficiency. This is, can be easily understood because for an individual link, you can always increase your throughput to any amount that you want if you are able to transmit at higher data rate. So basically this is channel's capacity formula without considering any interference. On the other hand, if we consider this spectral efficiency, Whenever there's interference in the network, even if we increase the transmit power, its spectral efficiency will be bounded. So for example, when alpha is 0 0.1, it's 10%. In this case, it means the interference is 10% of the signal power. So in this case, when you are, in for the, you are increasing your power, your spectral efficiency first will be increased. So it's like this. This spectral efficiency will be first increased. But on the other hand, after a while, when you are further increasing your power, you will increase the interference to the others. The overall network spectrum efficiency, or the overall network throughput, will saturate very soon. So in this particular case, this spectrum efficiency upper bound is around seven. So now you can see the huge difference. If there's no interference, the spectrum efficiency can be infinite. But on the other hand, whenever there's interference, like 10% of the signal power, in this case, it drops dramatically to seven. So the performance loss is infinite, basically. And then this shows that if the alpha is 50%, then this bound is further lowered. And for this case, it's 100%. On the other hand, for energy efficiency, for energy efficiency, you can see that when alpha is zero, when we are so now we are seeing this relationship, energy efficiency, spectral efficiency relationship. And now for this, in this case, when alpha is zero, so there's no interference in the network. In this case, this shows that, that the energy efficiency will be maximized when the spectral efficiency is here. This means if you are using energy efficient transmissions, the spectral efficiency that you will achieve is around 6.2 bits per second per hertz. So this is basically the throughput you will achieve for this particular case. 
And uh, now you can see, on the other hand, that means if you are using energy field transmissions, you will lose some throughput. And indeed, the loss of the throughput is infinite. Right? If you compare it with the spectrum efficient transmissions. Because if you desire higher throughput, you can always boost its power and to achieve any high throughput you want. Right? So that means the spectrum efficiency upper bound can be infinite. But on the other hand, if you are using energy field transmissions, it only achieves 6.2 spectrum efficiency. So now you can see, if there's no interference, then the loss of the throughput or spectrum efficiency is infinite. When there's no other users, only one user. But on the other hand, in the real networks, whenever there are multiple users reusing the same res resource, there will be interference. So for example, if alpha is 10%, in this case, if we are using energy efficient transmissions, you can see the achieved spectral efficiency is only is around 4.3. And what's very interesting now is that if you are energy efficient transmission, in this case, you will lose a limited amount of spectral efficiency compared with spectral efficiency operations. Because when alpha is 10%, the spectral efficiency upper bound is now around 7 bit per second per hertz. So now if you're using energy field transmissions, it's around 5. So now you only lose 2 bits per second per hertz. But you can see the performance loss of using energy field transmissions drops dramatically from infinite. Previously, it is infinite to this, only 2 bit per second per hertz in real interference limited networks. This gap, we can call this as a gap, performance gap. This gap further reduces when we have heavy interference, like this is 10%. If we have 50% interference, now this gap is like only around 0.2 bits per second per hertz. And if it's 100%, like cell edge, where you will have inter experience basically almost the same amount of interference compared to the signal. In this case, you will see that it's almost negligible completely. But on the other hand, the energy field communication has great advantage because by using energy field transmissions, you will choose exactly the right amount of power and, and, and the right data rate so that it achieves the highest energy efficiency. But on the other hand, you can see that if you deviate slightly from this particular point, you will lose a lot of energy efficiency, but you won't gain anything in spectral efficiency. So with that means, in interference limited networks or in real networks, by using energy efficient transmission technologies, we are able to achieve the highest energy efficiency without losing almost any spectral efficiency. And it's very advantageous in real communication networks. For energy efficient transmissions, I would say it's, uh, it's affected by all layers of the system. We have just introduced some very basic things like transmission and uh, transmitting in flat fading and frequency selective channels, and also we consider some interference. So on the other hand, when we move up to the network level, and even to further up to the global internet level, and to the globe, right? And I would say the simpler system is, then the more understanding we have, but when we grow up, then the understanding will get less and less. So that means we should focus more efforts on these parts. First, I would like to introduce this energy efficient traffic reshaping. So this is a joint work together with Pinyang Chang. Here, in mobile data networks, all energy are consumed because they, they need to serve the traffic. The, tra the traffic, on the other hand, is distributed in different locations. So the question is, can we reshape the traffic so that it can dramatically improve the energy efficiency of the overall system? So this traffic reshaping, for example, you can be connected to this base station or some other base stations. And then when you are connected to different base stations, they are like the traffic is reshaped. But on the other hand, we need to understand, will, this, will there be any like gain there? Or is there anything that we need to do there? Nowadays, we have already found that in base stations, the traffic varies a lot at different time of the day, right? Even at the same time, at different locations, the traffic will be completely different. So people have developed like technologies called deep sleep and DTS for the base stations. Because before this, we, for the base stations, they are always running to solve the traffic to maximize performance. So nowadays, people have 
develop these so called these deep sleep technologies so that, for example, the base stations, they will be able to turn off a lot of components when there's significantly less amount of traffic. And on the other hand, if even when the base stations are serving some traffic, they are still be able to use DTS. DTX stands for this continuous transmission. So for this too, with deep sleep, it's mainly for the purpose of the variation in the long-term traffic traffic. In this case, it, we will be able to reshape the traffic in the spatial domain because when we are turning off, I would say this deep sleep basically is almost like turning off base stations. So now when we are turning off some base station, we are forced to let the remaining active base stations to serve the, all the traffic. Now the traffic is kind of reshaped. So that means while you are able to save the energy of those in deep sleep, you are forcing the remaining active base stations to serve more. That means you will hurt their energy efficiency. So then there will be a trade-off. The question is what we should do. For example, how many base stations should we turn off? And uh, how many base stations should we turn off in different areas? Okay, on the other hand, we have the DTS microsleep. So this is something that we can easily do. Yeah. And uh, in our model, we use this, this to model the distribution of the networks and also the distribution of the users. So the, both the base stations and the mobile users are modeled using the spatial Poisson process. The, for the long deep sleep base stations, we use Poisson point process with density lambda b times one minus the probability of deep sleep. So here lambda b is the density of all base stations, and then p is the probability for a base station to be in deep sleep mode. And then the traffic request is modeled using a homogeneous temporal spatial Poisson arrival process with intensity lambda u of t per packet per second per unit area. Then we use this simple power consumption model. And it also consists both the circuit power consumption for computation purposes and the communications power consumption. So we have P0 and then delta PT. P0 is a circuit power consumption and then delta PT is the amount of power used for serving the traffic. And then for devices or for both base stations in the microsleep mode, its power is PMS. And uh, if the base station is in the deep sleep mode, it's consuming PDS. So usually the PDS is way more small, smaller than PMS. And the PMS is smaller than this, the power consumption in the active mode. So this, uh, this I would say this is a well accepted power model. And uh, here our focus is on the overall nettle energy efficiency and the overall nettle spectral efficiency. And we have said whenever we consider this energy efficiency and uh, we always need to consider the overall nettle performance. So this is, this can be illustrated by taking a look at these two metrics. For the overall, for the ergodic average network spectrum efficiency, basically here we want to calculate the expectation of the sum of the link spectrum efficiency of all links in a certain area. So this is for a unit area. Because here we are considering a, a general network, so it can be of infinite area. But here we consider focus on a unit area. So now, after some simple mass manipulation, we will achieve this simple rule. We have rho lambda b, expectation of e to se. So this is the link, this is the average link spectral efficiency. So this is the base station density. And then this is the rho is the traffic load. And then for every network energy efficiency, then we need to use, get the sum throughput in the area divided by the total energy consumption in the area. So that's why we have this rho w expectation of eta se divided by pa times rho plus one minus rho theta. So here, the rho is the network load, and the basin it is the percentage of utilized resources at the base stations. Theta is the percentage of the, or is the ratio of the power consumption in the microsleep mode divided by <coughs> the power consumption in the active mode. So now you can see, here for the network energy efficiency, it's no longer about dividing the, the throughput by the total energy consumption of one user. It's about adding up all 
base stations in the network and their energy consumptions. So in order to analyze these two, we need to first get to the SNR distribution. For the SNR distribution, since we consider a general wireless network, to calculate it, indeed, is very difficult. And uh, luckily, we, the, we can use the stochastic geometry method to obtain the SNR distribution. So for homogeneous cellular network with cell DTS, when the traffic load is rho, the CDF of the downlink transmission SNR is given by this complicated formula. So you can see the probability for the SNR to be no bigger than gamma is given by this, where beta is a fixed formula. So this beta is dependent only on alpha and gamma. So now we have the SNR distribution of, the, of all users in a unit area. However, you can see this formula is very complicated. So if we want to do the throughput calculation and do the energy efficient calculation based on this, it's completely impossible. All that you can do is using numerical calculations. So then we are motivated to find some simpler solutions. So indeed, if we can assume the network to be interference limited, then the SNR distribution can be greatly simplified to be this simple formula. So we move this to this. And based on this simple formula, indeed, we will be able to get closed form network spectrum efficiency and closed form network spectrum efficiency. So I would say in the past, we have always heard that A, we will assume the network to be interference limited in many scientific papers or in many conferences. However, I would say no one has ever told you what's the meaning of interference limited. What is the rigorous definition of being interference limited? So we did some study on, on this, and uh, we find something very interesting. So we find this theorem for any particular small number, like 1% or 0.5%. If this inequality is true for a certain network, then the difference between, the, between this and the, this distribution will be smaller than epsilon. So this one basically tells the left side, lambda b, is the density of the base stations in the network. So that means if the density of the network is above this, basically it tells you that if the network is sufficiently dense, then you can save, it is safe for you to assume it is interference limited. In this case, you can use SIR instead of SINR. So on the left side, it's shows, it draws the SINR and the SIR when the traffic load is 0 0.6 and the interside distance is, it has different interside distance like 300 meters, 1,000 meters, and 3,000 meters. You can see the difference is completely negligible. And then on the right side, here, we assume the difference is 1%. That means the SINR and the SIR difference is 1%. It's smaller than 1%. In this case, this table gives you the maximum interside distance required when the path loss exponent has different values, like 2.5, 3, 3.5, and 4. So you can see, after examining this, and this is only 1% difference, it is safe for us to accept higher tolerance rate, like even 5%, I think that's acceptable. Then we will be able to, the maximum allowed interside distance will be much larger. So that means basically, all that this tells is that in most practical scenarios, it is safe for us to assume that the network is interference limited. And then, based on this theorem, we are able to calculate the network spectrum efficiency and energy efficiency in the closed forms. So here on the top, we are able to get this, this area spectrum efficiency. It is this. And then we have the network energy efficiency. It is this. Now, since we have obtained the closed form, we are able to further dig into the details to examine or to find out the impact of different parameters on the area spectrum efficiency and the area network efficiency. And by examining these properties, we are able to find that the spectrum, network spectrum efficiency is monotonically increasing in the network throughput, or network load. So this one is very straightforward. It tells you that if you want to increase the network spectrum efficiency 
All you need to do is try to increase its traffic load to be as much as possible. Then the network spectral efficiency will be maximized. On the other hand, the network, efficiency, net, network energy efficiency is completely different. And indeed, it's also a strictly quasi-concave function of the network load. And on the other hand, if the power consumption in the micro, micro sleep is bigger than a certain percentage of the power consumption in the active mode, then the network energy efficiency is also monotonically increasing in load. Only when the power consumption in the micro sleep mode is smaller than this theta times PA, then in this case, it's quasi-concave. It first goes up and then goes down. In this case, there exists an optimal traffic load that maximizes the network energy efficiency. So now this one tells you that, I would say this is the scenario that happens most of the, of the time. On the other hand, this optimal traffic load, we also derived this optimal traffic load given the network node. In the practical network, in different areas, the network conditions will be different. So in this case, this optimal traffic load will vary slightly or a lot in different areas. So you need to apply this technology in different areas depending on the surrounding network conditions. And then you will be able to reshape the traffic so that the overall network energy efficiency is maximized. So this is what this theorem tells you. And on the other hand, what's very interesting is this threshold, the percentage of micro sleep power consumption divided by the active power consumption, this threshold, the theta, is uniquely determined by only one thing, that is the path loss exponent, the wireless environment, basically. So now you can see, somehow magically, the energy efficient operations of the network is connected directly to the wireless channel properties, nothing else. Because all these power are consumed for us to compensate for the loss in combating the wireless attenuations. So this explicitly reveals this relationship. Yeah, so theta equals this omega alpha, and this omega alpha is uniquely determined by this formula. Here, this beta is determined by, by, by here. So you can see in all these formulas, it's only related to this path loss exponent. So this one further compares our results in both analytical and simulation. You can see they match very well with each other. So the modeling is accurate, and the analysis is right. So now I would like to look at this from a different perspective. In the past, we, in the past 100 years, I would say there's uh, the Martin Cooper observed something very interesting. So he concluded that the number of simultaneous voice data connections doubles almost every 2.5 years. So the cumulative development has been over a, tree, over a trillion times in the past 90 years. Or in the past 45 years, there's a 1 million times more capacity increase. I would say this is globally. And if we dig into the details, you will see that out of this 1 million times increase, there's a 25 times more because of the more spectrum available. And also, and another 25 times is because we are using better modulation coding technologies. And, but for all the other 1,600, it's all due to the increase of frequency reuse. So the frequency reuse basically is allowing different transmitters to send data at the same frequency at the same time. So by deploying base stations denser and denser, we are able to increase the frequency re reuse higher and higher. So now we have achieved this frequency reuse one because different cells now you will use the whole bandwidth everywhere. This is the standard deployment in LTEA systems. So now the question is, moving forward, can we get higher frequency reuse? Obviously, that's needed. <clears throat> If we can do that, then we will greatly boost the network capacity a lot. It is possible. And uh, there will be many technologies. In the following, I will just introduce one and uh, what we believe 
would be the promising solution is device to device communications. So with device to device communications, these devices will be able to communicate with each other directly without the need of relaying traffic through the base station. And then, since the base station is still there, it will provide some basic assistance and also some controlling and monitoring of the communications between the D2D devices. This has a great motivation to enable like proximity services, public safety, traffic offloading, higher, and also try to achieve higher spectral efficiency and energy efficiency. It's a low cost solution for reusing frequency in short distance communications. And on the other hand, there's also a lot of challenges. Interference is always, always the most challenging thing. So for D2D communication, it's kind of a secondary medium access in multiple access, multiple cell networks. Because when the devices are in a D2D mode, they can always choose to switch to the communication directly to the base station. So this direct communication between devices is something optional. You can choose to use it to improve your spectrum efficiency and energy efficiency. Or if you can't do it, you can just fall back to the communication direct to the base station. Right? So it's like a secondary medium access. It's optional. And then in this case, for this kind of hierarchical communication architecture, how should we design it? Indeed, for this new structure, there will be two levels of interference. And the one level of interference is the interference caused by the cellular networks. And uh, for example, from the cellular UE towards other base stations, from cellular UEs towards the D2D links. For this part, I would say there's nothing that we need to do. For example, I mean, even there are interference from the cellular UEs towards D2D links. There's nothing we need to do because if the D3D links could not tolerate that interference from the cellular communications, you can switch to the cellular communications directly. So there's nothing we need to do here. On the other hand, there's also interference caused by the D2D networks. So for example, from the D3D links towards the base stations, from D2D links towards the other D3D links. So in this case, it's different. We need to develop dedicated intercell interference coordination for D2D in this case. This is because for intercell interference, it affects the cell edge performance a lot. On the other hand, the D2D communications will happen a lot at cell edges because that's where communications in proximity will achieve the highest SNR. Because they are close to each other, so they will achieve high signal power. On the other hand, the interference is limited because they are far away from the base stations. So this is where the most problem will happen. And obviously, at the cell edges, there will be a lot of interference from other cells. So it is essential for us to consider this inter-cell interference coordination. And on the other hand, since we consider multiple cell joint design, it is essential for us to consider low complexity technologies. Because I mean, if you don't care about the complexity, it's always easy. It's always a you can try to do the joint optimization across all sales, but the complexity is crazy. It, it will never go into practice. So the question is, how should we develop low complexity technologies to enable like, efficient D2D communications to harvest the potential additional gain in frequency reuse? So this further illustrates these two levels of interference on cellular UEs and D2D UEs there will be some trade-off. If we want to achieve higher capacity, we can always use higher number of D2D links. But on the other hand, it will require more signaling overhead for the quality of service assurance. On the other hand, the technology needs to be scalable in the sense that since we consider multiple cells, there will be 10 cells, 50 cells you want to consider jointly. So your solution should not depend on the cell size. then it will be scalable. So the focus here would be to try to evaluate the scalability of D2C communication with, <coughs> within cellular network. We consider the practical multi-cell scenario. And also we will consider the availability of CSI. So for example, we consider like there will be no CSI available to the d 3 links. There will be some limited amount of CSIs and there will be perfect CSIs, right? The question is how should we do for each to deal with each scenario. So the design objective here is trying to maximize the frequency reuse. We want to see the potential of the frequency reuse here. 
So we want to maximize the number of DTCP pairs that can communicate at the same time. Meanwhile, we want to assure the quality of service to both central UE and D2T links. So this is a simple math modeling. We have the quality of service constraint. The first, we have the SNR requirement for the central UEs, and we have the SNRs for the D2T links. Both of these types of users should have their SNRs above their targets, like this gamma TH for this cellular UE, gamma TH for the D2D link. On the other hand, we need to keep something in mind. Whenever we introduce some D2D links in the cellular system, there will be some performance loss for the existing cellular users. It has to be there, because if you don't tolerate any performance loss, you will not allow any additional D2D transmissions, because D2D transmissions then will always generate some interference. So the question is, how should we quantify that? Then we introduce this so-called delta, this acceptable target CUE SNR loss. So for example, for the cellular user, users, their SNR target can be 15 dB. But on the other hand, in practice, their application may tolerate like 13 dB SNR. So in this case, it allows a 2 dB performance loss. And that's the amount of performance loss we can exploit to enable D2D communications. We can see the multiple cells. So this N is the number of cells. In each cell, there's this number of D2D links. So here, this will be the design parameters. So if you look at the SNRs of the cellular user and D2D, there's this phi xk for D2D links. So this phi xk is either 0 or 1. So if it's 0, that means the D2D link is not enabled. If it's 1, that means it is using D2D communications. So it's basically this phi xk is like this mode selection indicator. And on the other hand, there's another design parameter, which is the power used by the cellular user and D2D links. Here we focus on D2D links. So there are two sets of design parameters. One is this phi xk. Another is PXK. Our focus is on the frequency reuse. So the frequency you reuse in this case is defined as the sum of phi xk plus 1. Basically, this is the total number of simultaneous connections at the same time in the cell. And also, this is the meaning of frequency reuse. It makes sense, right? So to maximize the network frequency reuse, the objective is equivalent to maximizing the sum of the frequency, basically we are trying to, we sum up the frequency you use of all cells. And then we want to maximize, that's it. And the optimization parameters are the phi ij and the power. For this approach, one straightforward way is we can use exhaustive search to find the best power and mode selection for all the D2T links. So this is the optimal admission control. And but in practice, this never happens because the complexity is just too high. So we are trying to simplify it and uh, develop something simple. We will try to use the approach based on statistical method. And here we are trying to estimate the interference based on the density of the D2D links in the network. Because the more D2D links you accept in the network, the more interference they will generate to the other D2D links and also to the existing cellular UE, UEs. So we find this expected interference in a certain area, given the density of D2D links in, a, in, in that area. Because, I mean, for the density of D2D links, that's something very easy to obtain. The base station, they know how many D2D links are there in the network. So if we know the density, that's all that we need to know. And then we will be able to estimate the interference anywhere in the whole network. So this gives this idea. And then based on this, we are able to develop something very simple called distributed admission control. So with this distributed admission control, the D2D links will decide independently their active status and their transmission power. So we find two power bounds. One is called this lower bound to assure quality of service to each D2D link. And another is the lower upper bound to control the interference to cellular users. So the, upper, the, the, the lower bound this is the power you should allocate to meet your own quality of service requirement. So this is a lower bound for the D2D links. On the other hand, this upper bound is 
the power you should use the maximum, the maximum amount of power you should use, so that the interference generated to the sending UEs from the detrain links is below the tolerance level. So this can be calculated by each D3 link independently. That's the key here. And then after they obtain these two bounds, they know that, oh, this is the power I should use to meet my own quality of service requirement. On the other hand, I also know the amount of power I should use so that I won't affect the existing D2D, uh, the existing cellular users too much. Then it's very simple. They will simply compare these two bounds. And if the lower bound is smaller than the upper bound, then know, oh, it's safe for me to transmit. I can communicate in the D2D mode. And on the other hand, if we want to maximize the frequency you reuse, that's also another key. The transmit power should always be selected as the lowest possible, that is the lower bound. Because when you are minimizing your transmit power, you will allow more other D2D links to transmit at the same time. That's quite straightforward as well. So indeed, this approach is compatible to the LTEA standard. So in LTEA standard, they have already had some kind of transmission power configuration for transmission for D2D links. And then all they need to do is just applying this minimum power requirement, choose the minimum possible, and then you can use it. And then you will be able to maximize your frequency reuse. So now let's take a look at some more from the signaling perspective. In order to implement it, this base station can simply get the active status of D2D links and then calculate the number of active D2D links. And then they can simply exchange the number of D2D links in the cells. So this is also kind of like exchanging the frequency reuse number in different cells. Because it's the same, right? If you know the frequency use, you know the number of D3 links in the cell. So these are equivalent to each other. After you exchange it, then you broadcast these parameters. Then the D2D pairs, they will be able to calculate by themselves. And then know if they should transmit in D3 mode and what power they should use based on the lower bound and upper bound. So you can see it's very simple. It's just a couple of equations, three, four equations. Of course, there are tons of equations when we derive this thing, but this is the result. It's extremely simple. So now let's see how, what we can achieve. Based on our result, the frequency reuse above 10 is absolutely achievable using this simple D2D technology. So on the left side, it shows the CDF of the number of D2D links. So this one is the one based on exhaustive search. Basically, this is the optimal approach. And then with this simple distributed admission control, this can achieve this. So you can see it can achieve easily 10 simultaneous D2D transmissions, communications, in a real multi-cell network. And these are the other approaches based on single-cell designs. And on the other hand, this one shows the improvement of spectral efficiency. So you can see by using D2D and also this multi-cell design, the spectral efficiency is dramatically increased from this maybe 5 bits per second per hertz to 50 bits per second per hertz. So it's 10 times increase. That's a lot, huge. And this shows the spectral efficiency. And the, here the x and y axis are the 95 percentile cellular UE SNR losses, and this is 5 percentile SNR of active D3D links. So basically these are performance re requirement of the cellular users, and then this is the performance requirement of the, SN of the D3D links. This red surface is using the distributed design across different cells. So basically it's like ICIC for D2D. You can see the performance is much higher than the other approaches. The one at the bottom, at the, at the bottom here, is the one that considers only single cell design. It also enables D2D, but it, don't, it only considers this single cell design. There's a great limitation, but the, by considering multiple cell jointly, we can see the performance boost is, is amazingly high. On the other hand, the D2D is effective in increasing both spectrum efficiency and energy efficiency. And here, you can see, this is the x axis is the average spectral efficiency, and the y axis is the average energy efficiency. So basically, this is showing the spectral efficiency and the energy efficiency region of different approaches. This in this corner is the case 
when we don't use any D2D. So you can see this is an achievable spectrum efficiency and energy efficient region. It's within this small corner. But on the other hand, if we are using D2D, this region is greatly extended. It's like, I would say, how many times? It's six. It's like 36 times improvement in the area of coverage. So you can see these users, they can achieve this spectrum efficiency and energy efficiency region at these, these dots. And of course, you can further, I mean, here, this is based on simulations. You can do some further theoretic analysis to show what's going to be the, like, the bound of the spectrum efficiency and energy efficiency region without D2D and with D2D. And you will see there's a great potential there. Right. So to harvest this 10 times time frequency reuse, and at first, we can see that D2D is quite potential. It's a very potential, like promising solution. It can achieve more than 1,000 times uh, percent increase or 10 times increase of spectrum efficiency and energy efficiency. On the other hand, it only requires negligible performance loss for the existing cellular UEs. To maximize the frequency reuse, we, it's essential for us to use the lowest possible transmit power. And also, this multi-cell joint design is essential here. Because you can see, if you use only single cell technology, their performance is very low compared to this joint cell, like that considers ICIC, right? It's a dramatic improvement. So new ICIC needs to be developed to handle this D2D interference. And it's 10 times free capacity boost. You don't need to install anything else. No more antennas, no additional spectrum. So only software, software update or whatever. So it's very, it's free game. Okay. We have just discussed discuss this like fundamental capacity approaching transmissions and also like some technology for us to further increase the frequency reuse so that we can increase the energy efficiency and spectrum efficiency. On the other hand, as I've, we have said before, this energy efficiency is affected by the, the total, the all layers of the system. If we look at something even more general, this concept of energy efficient designs can be applied in I would say anything. So now I would say we can consider energy efficient digital ecosystems to develop a new generation of ecosystems. In the past decades, we have witnessed a huge wave of transformation, and indeed, we, it is still ongoing within this ICT sector. For example, we have this Internet of Things, robot, UAVs, like smart cities, smart homes, smart buildings, autonomous vehicles, and all this. So many more. Innovations are expected in the coming decades, I would say then in the previous century. So this transition presents a significant opportunity for us to improve the economic productivity. It also provides unprecedented gains in the affordability, the accessibility, and also energy efficiency. And furthermore, all this will consume a lot of energy. So it is critical for us to understand in general the role of energy consumption in all these systems and also their energy efficient designs. So in the following, I will give a simple example. We, are, we can consider energy efficient crowdsourcing. So this crowdsourcing basically is for individuals and organizations to obtain goods and services. For example, ideas, housing, taxi, finances from a large, relative, open, and often rapidly evolving group of internet users. There are some examples which we know very well, like Airbnb or Uber or whatever. Those are crowdsourcing. So for these systems, we also need to consider their energy efficient designs. So let's take this as an example. It's Free Linguist, which is also a crowdsourcing system. It is a crowdsourcing system that is to provide language services like editing, proofreading, translation and where you can find freelancers to work for you. So like, it's like a matchmaker. Like it has contributors, and also these contributors are the public interested in serving even very small amount of their time in language projects. When they are free, they have nothing else to do, they want to provide this service. And also there's this kind of project developers, like people who need assistance in language assistance. For example, you may want to need to polish your funding proposal or like some reports or scientific or like blog articles or whatever, right? 
And then they can use this free linguist to exchange their need and, uh, and then help each other. And then it has this 100% satisfaction guarantee because, because you will only approve when you are 100% happy with the delivered result. So for this kind of system, the question is, is energy field design important? And what benefit can we generate by using energy efficient designs? Let's take a look at the steps of using this system and what kind of things are involved. And then we will understand better how energy efficient design will play a role here. So to use this system, you first, well, do you need some test work? Yes, if you need, then you can simply create a project in this platform. And then this platform will advertise this to the people who can help. And uh, then those who are willing to help, the, the contributors, if they are interested and they are, help, they are willing to help, they will place bids for this. After that, you can simply choose the one that you like the most. You will find their qualifications, their background, their degrees, and all that. So then there will be this kind of, you choose the one, and then the contributor is, help, is willing to help, and then the matchmaking is done. And after that, you will have complete the work, and you will like, approve the job to be completed and pay after you are 100% happy. So this is the overall process. So on the other hand, if you look at it from the system perspective, so now the input is based on the original text, your requirement. And then the output of the system is a perfect test delivered. So here, for the perfect test delivered, it can be measured by the amount of the bits, the information bits delivered. So now we have the delivering output, which is bits. On the other hand, for the system, it has many entities, like the owners, the freelancers, the terminals, the devices you are using to access the network, and also the core network, and furthermore, the, this free linguist platform. For this, if you take this energy efficient design, I would say it's not just design, it's the philosophy, it's the methodology. You take this into account when you are implementing such a system. You need to consider, for example, energy efficient conflict resolution. Different users, they will have conflict in interest. How should you handle it? So that the energy consumption of different parties will be minimized. And also, energy efficient access control. Like different users, they will access the platform at the same time. How should you resolve the conflict and uh, design their access so that the, the server can have, its, ha have the minimum power consumed. And also energy field front desk, front end and back end communications. And also energy field back end scheduling because at the back end we need to schedule different users at the same time. So how should we handle that? And especially, this one is something important. For example, energy efficient psychological prediction and analysis. Why I should raise this? This is because this energy is always consumed by people. So understanding the psychological behavior of the people, of the human beings, is essential when we are designing a real interactive system. Because by understanding their behaviors, then we will be able to design the systems that will please the people the most so that they will likely to use maybe the system at a much smaller amount of time while they are still 100% happy then you will assure the quality of service while minimizing the energy consumption. All these are involved. So by using this energy fear and design philosophy, we will, be able to, we will be able to generate an extremely lean and fast platform for the highest cost efficiency. Uh, today I've introduced some fundamental energy efficient capacity approaching technologies, and also I've introduced, tried to introduce some new research topics, for example, and efficient traffic reshaping. How should we adjust the traffic load in different areas so that the overall network energy efficiency increased? And also we can use this frequency, the D3 technologies to boost the frequency reuse of the whole network so that it can be achieved like 10 times capacity free capacity boost can be achieved at the cost of nothing. And also we can develop energy efficient ecosystems. So it's a huge area. And also we have compared the timeline of the wireless technology and the, the lighting technology. We can think in the following decades, maybe in the following 50 years or longer time, there will be a lot of amazing discoveries in this energy field communications. So it's a huge research area. And in the past, we have been working on it for about, maybe the, the, the public focus is started around 2010, but it's just eight years. There are still many decades ahead. 
So if you need more information, you can even refer to these two books. I was, was going to ask, um, when you're trying to address like the body Mac layer, uh, you probably have to have sensing mechanisms in place that are listening for these things and trying to do the planning. I mean, is there a trade-off for how much energy or spectral efficiency you lose to do that work? Uh, yes, indeed. I was, this question has uh, I've been considering this question a long time back. So this can be generally applied in cognitive radio systems and, and so on and so forth. They are quite similar to each other. So here, again, it's the philosophy. There's nothing free. And the, the meaning of free things here basically is energy consumption. So if you buy something from somebody, they are moving, they are consuming energy. So that's the idea. So now when you are doing sensing, it is consuming energy. So the more energy you consume, the more, the, the more accurate you will get for making the decisions. And those more accurate results will help you to boost your performance at the later communications. So it depends on how much energy you should use for sensing and then make the following transmissions. But on the other hand, obviously, if you don't make any, if you don't invest any energy in sensing, then the performance will be terrible. But on the other hand, if you spend a lot of time in sensing, then the performance may be good, but you will spend too much energy in sensing. So the sensing energy will increase linearly in time, but the performance increase maybe do a saturate very soon. So now the question is, where is that optimal point? So I would say you can easily do some modeling and then find, it, find that opt optimal sensing time to maximize the energy efficiency in this, this system. Yeah. Feed data back and use kind of a predictive. Uh... That's right. I would say this is a really quite a good question. I would say this one completely depends on your applications. So for some applications, they don't need real-time data. So they, in this case, you, you, it is tolerable for us to like, sense once in maybe 10 minutes or 5 minutes. But on the other hand, if you really want to exploit those dynamics in the traffic, in this case, you will consume, need to consume much more energy in, in sensing. And on the other hand, when you are, I mean, from the spatial domain, if you want to deploy many sensors to, to sense, to connect data in different places, and there's also this spatial sampling cost there, right? So in this case, you want to find the trade-off in the spatial domain. How should you develop it? Because of obviously, if you de deploy more sensors, you will be able to get more accurate data, like in the whole area. But on the other hand, the more sensors you deploy, the more energy will be consumed. And especially the more like maintenance cost, uh, maintenance effort will be needed. Because in the long run, those sensors, they will not be there forever. So you need to maintain it. So this kind of maintenance is important. And on the other hand, it kind of also consumes energy because for people to go there and uh, go there and uh, maintain the sensors, it's kind of the human being, they need to consume their energy. They need to eat food to, so that they can walk there and uh, maintain. So, so there's a trade-off there. So I would say it really depends on the applications. And when you, are, you try to develop the approaches, the first thing you need to consider is what's going to be the application requirement. And then based on that, you need to take this philosophy inside and then, and then try to consider everything. And then you will be able to, to design a system that is really cost effective. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question on the, the DoD links. Um, what you presented makes sense and the results or anything you're showing there, but I was just wondering, um, from, from an, like applying a type, has anyone ever done like kind of like a, analysis of potential in actual mobile traffic of the potential links, you know, a traffic analysis study or anything. So you mean traffic analysis to Yeah, show you know what I mean? Like what, so what you showed results in what you're saying so makes sense, results. but like in, a, in an actual deployed network, ah, what's I the see. potential for a device that's links that's actually right. out there? Uh, yeah, I get your point. So I would say what you, want, you say is like, for example, in real commercialized environments, right? So I would say this one for this, this D2D is a platform. So on top of this, it enables these so-called proximity services. So based on this, we are able to generate tons of other applications. Those are, can be called these ecosystems. So for those applications, they will generate a lot of, I mean, at maybe this year, there are not many applications. But as time goes by, there will be more and more interesting discoveries. So you're proposing more as a framework or a platform there. Exactly. To solve a problem that That's right. 
So this enables this, and in the future, there will be more and more. And then the more users rely on this, or the more people using this, the more gain we will get out of this. So I would say here, we say, yes, it's 10 times frequently reuse, free, I mean, you don't need to pay anything, but the future is right. Other questions? Uh, okay, yeah, so sorry, still one more question. I was gonna ask about like the device device, was that always kind of peer-to-peer -peer link, or did you ever assume a large mesh network, uh, or could it extend to a mesh network? That's right, exactly. For the mesh networks, I mean, they are quite, quite similar to each other, so it's like, the only difference here is that for the mesh, mesh network, maybe more loads are collaborating with each other, but for D2D, we focus on this one particular, particular link. But on the other hand, for the mesh network, when they are communicating, for this one mesh A to B, and uh, C to D, they are like simultaneous transmissions. So, so in this case, you may develop similar technologies to increase the simultaneous transmission at the same time so that we can increase their frequency reuse. 